Welcome to the Miniatures Paintbrush. Today we're going to paint up Nalzor's Marvelous Miniatures Dragonborn's Paladin and do a bit of a review about it as well. Enjoy! <laughs> Hello and welcome. Today what we're going to do is we're going to take this Dragonborn palette and at least one of these miniatures and we're going to paint that up for you guys. But while this is a little different, while painting these up we're going to do a review. First things first, that base got to go. Green Stuff World, I did a temple type of uh, base for it with some Nidatite. I rolled it out and I did a video about doing that. I'll put a link up here now. Okay, uh, so there's a link on how to make it, so you can make your own. Here is a product, a product that's quite interesting. Let's review the product itself as I open this up. This product here is called D&D Norzur's Marvelous Miniatures, uh, and its detail, even on the backing here, is pretty cool. On the back of the actual package, they have uh, painted miniatures and what they think that it might look like. And you have two, and that's right, two miniatures in one blister. So let's take a look at these bases. And let's compare it to a normal 32 millimeter base. It's tiny. It is tiny. I think, in my personal opinion, too tiny for the actual miniature, but it just about covers it, honestly. And I'll try that later. But really, yeah, that's not my style, personally. And in each blister, like I said before, you have two miniatures, and you can decide which one you want. Let's take a look at the detail. The detail is absolutely astonishing on these. They remind me of the pewter miniatures with the details, but you can actually see them. Uh, and it's it, it's very dramatic poses. I really like the poses. I really like um, that they're using Vallejo and they partner up with this Vallejo because I use Vallejo paints myself. Um, I'm going to decide to do this one here. And the one thing I don't like about this miniature is that mace. So I'm going to do a conversion for that mace. Mm -hmm. And, well, there's a lot of detail here. One of the things, let's test this out. Uh, the size of that base just is not appropriate at all. So it pays for you to invest in some bases if you wanted to. Uh, what I say properly display the miniature. Something like this. There it sits perfectly and it has room, which gives it really good framing. So laying it on there, since I have that custom rolled base and having this bottom piece, it just doesn't flow well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this bottom piece here, but I'm going to do it off camera because I really don't want to cut myself and I need to pay attention. Fast forward. Okay, there it is, removed, not a problem. And here is a sword, which I'm going to remove that mace and replace it with that sword. I think it would look a lot better. So, let's get at it. Let's see how quickly it removes. Now, I am used to Bones Miniatures, and that's what this miniature is going up against, Bones Miniatures. First off, the detail on these is far better than the Bones miniatures thus far that I have seen. However, cutting it like this, mm, it's not as easy. Bones miniatures are easy to cut. And yes, I am going to do a side-by-side -side kind of comparison through Bones miniatures and this miniature here. Bones miniatures, this sword is from Bones actually. And it's not a bendy one, it's a stiff one. It came from the Bones Kickstarter 3. It's actually a hard plastic and works really well for conversions. I highly recommend it. 
So I'm just gonna fit on the, the pieces here. For Bones miniatures, it was easier to cut off the pieces than it is to cut off pieces from this miniature. Like that base part that was on there, pre-sculpted, that was pretty difficult to pull off. Not so much with the Bones miniatures. Bones miniatures, hot life through butter. Okay, let's see how it takes a primer. And the reason why I'm priming it is that this miniature had mold lines. So even though it, was, it claims to be primed with Vallejo paint, it has mold lines, so once you get the mold lines off, you scraped off the primer. Another thing why I like to prime these is I can zenithal prime, so I'm going to go for that black for the darkest shadows, and now I'm moving up to a gray and a 45 degree angle just to create a gradient. And you can see the colors actually start building up. That gray is really turning from the black. And that's exactly what you want. You want a subtle uh, transition when it comes to your uh, pre-shading. And that's what this is called. So look at the way it stands there. I love that dramatic pose. And I love that cape. But I also dislike the cape. So what I, the reason why I dislike this cape uh, one of the reasons why I like this, dislike this cake, cape is because it doesn't come off. In other words, if I wanted to remove it so I can paint the back of the miniature, I can't do it. And that's frustrating for me. And the reason why that's frustrating for me is because there's areas of the model that's unpainted. And it just doesn't feel right. Like, I know that I could have done better. And every time I look at it, I look at that back piece. It stands out like a, store, a sore thumb for me, personally. So I'm not very happy that I can't really get in there effectively and paint it effectively the way I want to. But if that's the only problem, then that's not really too much of an issue for most people. All right, now I'm going to vary up some colors. Now the color scheme is a little interesting. I wanted to go for a fantasy kind of uh, theme. I was sent pictures that had these colors on it, so I try to match the colors as best as I possibly could. And um, I think it came out pretty well. I mean, at first, uh, I wasn't so happy with it, but it actually grew on me, and I kind of liked it. And now I do like it. <laughs> so it's an interesting, it's an interesting miniature, for sure. Uh, Dragonborns and Paladins. Wow. I remember playing uh, 3E edition, 3rd edition, and uh, 3.5 edition. And... Um, I never encountered, in all the years that I've been DMing, uh, Dungeon Mastering, I never actually encountered a Dragonborn Paladin before. I always thought the Dragonborn, since I used to read the Dragonlance novels, were wicked creatures twisted from actual dragons. And that's why there were no dragons in the world. Now I'm going for a red, uh, bringing some burgundies into the purple, meaning you have the cold colors matching the warm colors. And yes, I love my purples, that's for sure. Um, so yeah, so seeing a Dragonborn and a Paladin, what I think a Paladin is, is kind of odd to me. Uh, if you don't know, um, I've been starting to get into 5th edition, which is awesome. And really in the 5th in the edition, uh, Dragonborns are not only the Dragonborns from the Dragonlines, but dragonborns were, you know, born from dragons, as, you know, like their name. The dragonborns, they are very proud people. And people just really fear them. And that seems to be the issue or the stigma with the dragonborn. That people fear them because they look at them and they're like, uh-oh. And even if I would see them, if that was a character, they seem very intimidating. Some Dragonborns are faithful servants of true dragons. Others are form ranks as soldiers in great wars, and still others find themselves adrift with no clearer calling in life. Perfect for the adventurer, to be honest with you. If you look at a Dragonborn, like the one you see here, you look like a standing dragon in the humanoid form. It may lack the wings and the tail, but, you know, there's that. The first Dragonborn had scales of the hues of the dragons, but you know, as 
you know, many years passed by. They just kind of pretty, pretty much got uniform. Now, this one here, I was told, was a uh, black dragon. So he still had the hues. So he's one of those ancient ones who still have the hues of the colors of the dragon that they, um, that they represent. And I don't know if you guys know black dragons, that's some wicked business. So being a holy paladin and a black dragon at the same time seems like a conflict of interest, but there's an internal struggle which makes it really, really cool. Now they usually stand about six and a half feet tall uh, and weigh about 300 pounds or more. Their hands, are, hands and feet are strong and they have talon-like claws um, with three fingers and a thumb on each hand. So dragonborns usually, well, the ancient ones boast the red dragons and the green dragons, the blue dragons, white dragons. This is a lustrous black dragon. There's even metallic dragons, uh, the gold, the silver, brass, copper, and bronze. So again, ancient dragon. Now, dragonborns in and of themselves form clans. Um, and they, they devote themselves to their clans. Uh, even more so than to their gods. They just devote themselves to their clans. They are holy. They're a clan-based, they're tribal kind of clan-based, um, proud people. They hate to fail. They push themselves to extreme efforts before giving up on anything. Dragonborns hold mastery of a particular skill as a lifetime goal. Members of other races who share the same commitment find it easy to earn the respect of the dragonborn. So if you do want to respect one, you have to have that kind of dedication. Now, although the Dragonborns are proud people and very self-sufficient, they recognize that you know sometimes they even need help. And the best source of that help is exactly their clan. And they will go to the clan before they seek help from any other races, again, being proud of the way that they are. So it's kind of cool that this is a dragonborn, and you have an idea of what a dragonborn's like, very proud and, and you know, illustrious, and um, that's why I wanted to do some gold armor on this guy. I think that it definitely would match. Plus, I have a whole bunch of Stormcast Eternal, and I've never painted real gold metal before that I was ever happy with, ever. So this is an opportunity to be able to paint gold on a miniature and learn how to do it while I'm painting a miniature. I mean, I would think how hard can it be? <laughs> and, you know, to the most part, it wasn't that difficult to be able to put highlights with silver and, and you know, the shadows with some uh, Seraphon Sepia from Games Workshop. So it wasn't really that difficult, but mm, I don't know if I was all too, too happy with the result. Like, I can expect better for myself. I could push those shadows even deeper, and I think I could raise those highlights even higher. So... I mean, next time, I'm going to definitely come up with an improvement when it comes to that. So I'm first starting with um, a Vallejo um, Air Metallics, Metallic Air. Really awesome acrylic paint. Really awesome acrylic paint. It has great shine to it. And that's because the pigmentation is so dense. I mean, they have a really dense pigmentation. And that allows for uh, that metal flake and the pigmentation um, to really, since it's so finely ground, you can't really see the big old flakes. Now, if you've used the metallic paint before, just about any, even Vallejo, Vallejo model color comes to mind, um, they, they have metal flakes. You can see them. You know, it's pretty clear that, okay, this is metallic and it doesn't look to scale. This is the first paint, aside from, you know, straight alcohol-based paints, that really comes out this reflective and this fine without seeing any of that grit and those big metal flakes indicating, oh, he busted out the metallic paint on this job, right? <laughs> and you could tell because other artists that paint miniatures, they dissect other people's work. 
they literally try to take it apart with their eyes. Okay, I can see what they did here. They put a little coat of this, they put a little coat of that, they did a little dry brushing here, they did a come edge lighting, edge highlighting there, and they deconstruct how the other person did their miniature. And then they reconstruct that in their own style, and there's the miniature painting. And I'm sure that other artists in other fields, like painters of uh, canvases, do exactly the same thing. So I think this is universal when it comes to artists. And if you are a miniature painter and you're really trying to get serious about miniature painting, you start looking at people's work and what you got to ask yourself is, well, how did they do it? And how can I do it to it the way I want it to do it, but adding my own flair to it, but how can I do it? So you de you'll start deconstructing other people's miniatures and reconstructing it in your mind. And it'll be as natural. As natural as saying, hey, that's a great paint job. You're already de deconstructing it. I mean, it's too late. You've already deconstructed it. <laughs> the reason why you're saying it's a great paint job is because you know how much work went into it. So I'm taking a, a not-so-new brush. I'm not painting the gold on. I don't like to use my nice brushes to paint any kind of metallic paint on it. Something about the flakes, I, I, they're eventually going to tear up that brush. So I really don't want to use my nice brushes. And when I say nice brushes, I'm talking about Games Workshop brushes because I'm going to use my GW brushes until they completely collapse on me before I start with my Series 7. I have never used a Series 7 brush. And people are saying, are you mad? Why don't you just use them? And maybe I should. I don't know. I'm frightened to use a brush. I don't know. It's weird. And I think that's my biggest problem as an artist. Like I get frightened to do something and then I just prevent myself from doing it. Which is really dumb in my case because that's it, there's no way. Um, but I do have to say that these games workshop brushes for me are working quite well. I've painted every miniature that I've started when I started painting a couple of years ago, and they're still lasting strong. I admittedly, I take care of my brushes, but some people saying the series seven brush is a game changer. Hmm. We'll see, right? Uh, we will see, absolutely. Now I'll check that out. Okay, uh, speaking about miniature painting and doing something new, I love, love, love the holiday season. I do love the holiday season. And not because everybody wants presents and then, you know, my paycheck disappears. No, 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 no. What I do like about the holiday season is Graham's Workshop's Battle Forces. My goodness. That is awesome. I love those Battle Forces. I really do. I think that they are a credible value for, for what you get. And... You want to start an army? Boom, you can start an army. And really, it's amazing. My thing is, is that, you know, the addiction to the plastic becomes overwhelming. And before you know it, I want to get them all. But, you know, it's, it's a lot, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it's so, so great. And the sculpts are so great. And I really want to paint these models. So I'm putting my painting on uh, overdrive. What I'm doing is I'm really getting into it. I do have that Kickstarter coming in from Bones. I already have three. I, I, I ordered four and then some. So there's a lot that I have to paint, but that's not a burden. But what it is is a motivation. Like, all right, dude, get on the game. Start painting your minis. And that's what I'm doing. So I'm going through as many minis as I possibly can and painting it to a quality I'm happy with. Now, if you know me as a person, I nitpick about a lot of things. And then there's some things that I let go. I paint to my level, but then I always try to push myself a little bit in one direction. And my steps are baby steps. So it means when I improve, I don't improve dramatically. I improve slowly, steadily, and small. And for me, that's sustainable change. And that's what you do for sustainable change. Growing small. So I am getting with it, man. I am going to be painting a lot of minis and they're going to be on this channel and I am going to go for it. I recently did a terrain piece. Um... The Garden of Moor? No, not the Garden of Moor. It's the Bones equivalent to the Garden of Moor. It's a graveyard set from the Bones expansion. Okay, time to uh, tint this up with some blue. Um, 
So yeah, I'm gonna tint that up with some blue, and the reason why I'm doing that, because I know it's a blue sword, so I kinda wanna tie that in by giving subtle blue hints all around the mini, uh, so you can get that effect to it. Little bit of blue mixed in with that uh, purple makes all the difference to tie in the color. Now essentially what you're doing is using three colors here, uh, three color-ish here uh, or there, just to make sure that you unify the piece and not get too crazy with colors. Now I've done that. I've used 25 colors on one model and you know it, it turns into rainbow bright after a while. I mean it's fine if you're a Zinch model, um, if you're Gaming Workshop uh, Zinch, because they tend to be like multicolored so it's not a problem. But um, when it comes to just regular figures you kind of want to subdue that. In other words you want to unify it by using a limited color palette and really not pushing it too far. Um, and in doing so, what you can do is just add a little bit of white or add a little black, darken colors a little bit of subtle transitions through it, and you can really go to town. And uh, it works out really well. Okay, so this is a Dragonborn, but it is also a Paladin. What is a Paladin? Some people actually don't know what a Paladin, and a paladin is, and that's okay. That's okay if you don't know what a paladin is, because I'm going to here to just tell you a brief little history about paladins. Okay, so let's get into it. They are the cause of righteousness. A paladin is one that upholds justice and righteousness and stands with the good things of the world against encroaching darkness and the hunt of forces of evil wherever they lurk. Different paladins focus on different aspects because of righteousness, but all are bound by oaths that grant them power to do their sacred work. Although many paladins are devoted to you know, gods of good, the uh, paladin's power comes as much from his commitment to justice itself than it does from any other outside source. Paladins train for years to learn skills of combat, mastering a variety of weapons and armors. Even so, their martial skills are secondary to their magical power that they wield, the power to heal the sick and the injured, to smite the wickedness and the undead, and to protect the innocent from those who would join them in their fight for justice. They are, they are just completely all about justice. So almost by definition, the life of a paladin is an adventuring life, so they go on adventures. So unless uh, a lasting injury has taken them uh, from the adventuring time, every paladin lives on the front lines of the cosmic struggle for against evil. Fighters are rare among the ranks of the militants uh, and the armies of the world, but fewer people can claim to be a true paladin. When they do, they receive the call. These warriors turn from their former occupations and take up arms to fight evil. Sometimes their oaths lead them into service of the crown as leaders of the elite group of knights. But even then, their loyalty is first to the cause of righteousness, not crown and country. So, adventuring paladins take their work very seriously. They delve into ancient ruins, thus the crypts, and they can be quests driven by, you know, higher purpose in their acquisition of treasure. They're not just all about treasure, they're about a higher purpose in doing the right thing. So, if evil lurks in a dungeon, or primeval, primeval forest, or even the smallest victory against it can tilt the cosmic balance away from oblivion. They are here to save the universe by smiting evil whenever they can. It's all about the justice. It's all about lawful good. The paladins are lawful good. And they're here for justice. You gotta love a paladin like that. I mean, they can get annoying because they don't loosen up. You can imagine a paladin like hanging in a tavern and saying, um, I'd like milk, please. I will not joke. I will be totally serious. Yeah, well, I can see that. But um, that being it, as it is, that being it as it is, having a black dragonborn paladin is quite interesting. Because black is chaotic evil so there's an internal struggle going on here so my friend's character which is six i'm painting this up for a friend my friend 
character is really struggling here. This is the dichotomy of this is just ab absolutely baffling to me. So let's talk about the miniature a little bit more. I do want to talk about the miniature because this miniature is actually from this company uh, called WizKids. If you've never heard of WizKids before, let's talk a little bit about the actual company that makes the model. And then I'll give my final kind of like end notes when it comes to this miniature, comparing it to Reaper Bones, whether I buy this miniature or any other miniature in the line again or not. Uh, whether maybe you should, I mean, that always depends on what you're into. But I will do review this and tell you the upsides and downsides that I think and, you know, why you should or should not get this. All right. All right. So let's talk about WizKids itself, the company. Now, WizKids was best known for collectible miniature games or CMGs like Mage Knight, Hero Clicks, Mech Warrior, and Horror Clicks. All of them use a click system in which engages compact, uh, combat statistics and abilities of each figure, which was indicated by a turnable dial on the base underneath the figure. The last CMG was Halo Action Clicks, based on the Halo video game, and released in 07. The founder of WizKids' name was uh, Jordan Weissman, who is previously from FASFA, and that is the American publisher of role-playing games, war games, and board games between 1980 to 2001. So he was originally of FASFA, and he published this Mage Knight game while I'm uh, edge highlighting here. Uh, and if you want to see a video about edge highlighting, I do have one up here now. And that's pretty much the basis of edge highlighting and what I'm doing there with the white. Just using the side of the brush and not the tip of the brush and getting that paint in there with a little bit of Floyd. Um, so they became a really, really successful company. Um, they have a plethora of games. I mean, really, their headquarters is in New Jersey, but their products include Mage Knight, Hero Clicks, Mech Warrior, Pirates of the Constructible Strategy Game, Star Wars Pocket Model Trading Card Game, Halo Action Clicks, Star Trek. But I, I'm, I'm seeing that one of their hugest things uh, was, or a thing that actually turned the company around, which actually was bought by Topps Trading Card Company and uh, was again sold again, um, was uh, in 09 in the San Diego Comic Con. The National Entertainment Collection Association was showing off a Thor figure for Hero Clicks, indicating that they might be the new para company for WizKids, and they were. They bought them out from, uh, retained it by Tops. So, they had a retail promotion on Marvel Hero Clicks Hammer the Thor set, and they won awards for that. Uh, those figures were pretty good compared to the figures of old. The hero clicks were pretty bad, but I think that the uh, superhero ones were pretty decent. Again, getting a lot, a lot of awards for this. So unlike previous offering, offering the promotional figure, Ragnarok Sator was available in a 10-pack brick purchase uh, retail locations other than uh, mail-in redemption, which was their usual standard fare. Followed by a DC set, Hero Clicks Brave and the Bold, the promotional figure, the Batman and Catwoman duo figure. So it's Marvel and DC, and those are huge, huge companies to partner with, honestly. They did very, very, very well. So all their games um, was uh, includes all these, and I, there's a, quite a list. They have the Justice League, Freddy vs. Jason, Gremlins, The Hobbit. Uh, Mage Knight, Oshi, Pirates, Quest of Davy Jones, Gold, Star Trek Expedition, Star Trek Fleet Captains, Tesoro, Mage, Mage Knight board games. They have books like Mech Warrior Dark Age, uh, Mage Knight, collectible card games, yes, collectible card games, Battlestar Galactica, High Stakes Drifter, uh, dice building games, Quarriors, Lord of the Rings dice building game, Dice Masters, like Marvel Dice Masters, Avengers, Uncanny X Men. 
um, Avengers vs. X-Men, Elijah Ultron, The Amazing Spider-Man, Civil War, uh, DC Comics, Dice Masters, Justice League, War of Light, uh, World Finest, originally Superman, Batman, Yu-Gi-Oh! Dice Masters Series 1, Dungeons and Dragons, Dice Masters, Battle for Faroon, and Faroon on the Siege, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and then they have collectible miniatures game, The Clicks, Creepy Freaks, Crimson Skies, Halo Action, Hero Clicks, DC Hero Clicks, Marvel Hero Clicks, Indie Hero Clicks, the BR, BPRD and Hellboy Hero Clicks, City of Heroes Hero Clicks, uh, City of Villains, Invincibles, Gears of War, uh, Iron Maiden, The Lord of the Rings, Street Fighter, Star Trek, UGO, Horror Clicks, Mage Knight, Mage Knight Dungeons, Mech Warriors, Mech Warrior, Age of. There is a lot of games in here. This, this company is huge when it comes to this, and they need to be huge, especially if they're going to go after Reaper Miniatures, which is also huge really really huge reaper miniatures was the first miniature game company that i ever 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 even considered because i played D D and i was looking for miniatures and when i saw those they really impressed me they were the three giants when i started uh painting miniatures which were in no particular order privateer press uh games workshop and reaper miniatures i didn't even know there was another miniature company that existed previous to that. Sure, there was Fantasy Flight Games and there was Descent that started coming out, the first one, and they had miniatures, but it was different. It was board game miniatures, which didn't really, I mean, at first I thought they counted, but I don't know, it was weird because they already came pre-based and that bothered me for some reason. So what's the difference? And the question is, the difference between those two is what you consider a game token and what you consider an actual miniature. Now, it could be a placeholder. Um, I mean, if you go into a Monopoly game, right, and you pull out the card, the car, or the dog, or the, the steam engine, or whatever, and you can technically call that a miniature if you wanted to, right? Or is it a game token that you use for the game? Uh, that's debatable. <laughs> can you paint them? Yeah, sure you can. But is it a miniature? I don't know. It's like, you don't know, right? I don't know. What do you think? If you think that Monopoly board game pieces are miniatures, then, you know, say it in the comments below. I'm interested in starting that kind of conversation right there. Um, also, so let's get into, that's a whole debate. Like, I'm waiting for your response so I can continue that conversation. Uh, I can say where I stand. Where I stand is... Um, Gosh, this is a hard one. It, it really is thought-provoking. Um, I say if it looks like a, a, a... I don't know. I don't know. If it's a person, it's a miniature. But then if it's an animal, it's a miniature. I don't know. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> That's a hard, hard one. Um, if it's sculpted from something, it's a miniature. And if it's like a you know, a flat piece of cardboard, then it's a token. How's that? That's my stance on it, and I'm sticking with it, and that's it. All right, but back then I didn't consider it a miniature, so I've changed my point of view. Okay, now time for the floors. Just uh, I'm gonna brighten up some of that, uh, brighten up some of that stone. And I go back and forth with brighten up the stone and then darkening it up with the Nun Oil from um, Citadel. Games Workshop, and let's just go back and forth and just really just darken things up. So, game tokens. So, let's talk a little bit about Reaper Miniatures versus WizKids, and I don't even know if I'm saying it correctly. Uh, WizKids, D&D, Nalzur's Marvelous Miniatures. I like the packaging. I think it's cool. I think it's cool that if you buy a figure, you get an extra figure. I think that's cool. I like the fact that they're partnering with uh, Vallejo Paints. And they're primed and ready to paint for the people who don't want to remove mold lines. But who wouldn't want to remove mold lines? I do have to say about the mold lines for this miniature, it was kind of odd because the mold line was actually right across the cape. 
the cape I wish I could remove. And it was kind of awkward to remove all the mold lines that were on here. So if I wanted to start painting straight out the box, I guess if you wanted to have a big old flashing throughout your miniature, but I, I, I personally couldn't do that. So that novelty of having Vallejo paint is like, ah, eh, it's fine, whatever. The fact that these are uh, very well detailed. I mean, extremely detailed. Is it more detailed than Reaper? Well, uh, Reaper's upping their game. So, you know, this latest Kickstarter, I have high hopes for. Uh, so more detailed, I don't know. That's debatable. Depends on the miniature, really. And which Reaper bones, Reaper 1, Reaper 2, or so on and so forth. I do see that some of the textures and some of the molds when it came to this miniature was a little dulled out more than I expected it to be. Like when it's sitting in, for, and it's hard to explain because when it's sitting in the package, it seems to be very crisp. But, you know, when you take it out and actually paint it, not so much. Also, I'm noticing gaps in here, which that was, I mean, I don't think it should be. And I'm wondering if there's gaps, if I could have removed the, the head and cape if that was a possibility, but I didn't want to chance it because this is not my miniature. I painted it for a friend. So I just keep looking at it. The most disappointing thing was just not being able to get to the entire miniature because the cape was in the way and it was really difficult to be able to paint. And that was frustrating for me. I would have been a lot happier if I could get in there, if I could have removed the cape and be able to get in there. Uh, is it a little bendable plastic? Yeah, there's some give to it. There is some give to it, not as much as Reaper Bones. The weapons are very thin on this model, so if you paint it up, I suspect that it would break after a while, so be aware of that. And um, let's say for Reaper Bones models, they are nigh indestructible. Like, <laughs> I've tried to break them and they won't break, you know? threw them at things, and the bones never broke. This one, I suspect that if I threw it hard enough that pieces would fly off, in my personal opinion. Now, I haven't thrown it. Again, this is my friend's miniatures. I am tempted, but uh, I'm not. All in all, a great-looking miniature, decent, a decent put-together miniature, um, ready to come out the box and start playing if you don't want to paint it. If you do want to paint it, it's already primed if you don't mind all the mold lines. If you're going to remove the mold lines, then you're going to have to start and think about repriming it and the priming uh, with Vallejo paints become more of a novelty than anything else. So taking that into consideration, taking that into consideration, I wasn't... Uh, I wasn't too happy with the paint, painting one of these personally. Uh, so personally, I don't think I'll pick another one of these up. Although, although I must say that their tavern set looked pretty cool. That being said, I just saw a video on a crafting DM who created a tavern set that was really easy to put together. And, well, I mean, if it's there, might as well just, you know, get it there. Also, it may, may, may want me to look, because the tavern set was $25, to look at Reaper's uh, offerings and see what they have and see what I can get. Now, you can get directly from Reaper and pay a full price, or you could talk to your local gaming store and ask about incentives that they may have so you can get some kind of discount for your miniatures. And that, that, my friends, is the way to go. You support your local gaming store, which supports your local gaming community, which supports you because you'll have more people to game with. And it's just, it's, it's a win-win all the way around. If you do not have a local gaming store, then check uh, Amazon or eBay and see if you can get better prices for things there. And that goes for all miniatures. Be savvy shoppers, people. Be savvy shoppers. And remember, the more you save, the more paint you can get, the more materials you can get. Because let's be honest with you, this hobby isn't the cheapest hobby that you could possibly pick up. I think flipping napkins outside might be one of the cheapest hobbies. Breathing, breathing would be, but I don't know if breathing can be considered a hobby because, you know, if you stop, there's, you know, the alternative, you know. Um, walking? Walking can be a hobby. Or is it just exercise? I don't know. What constitutes as a hobby? 
There's another question for you. Guys, what constitutes as a hobby, really? Is it something you do on your spare time? Okay, so, you know, I pick my nose on my spare times occasionally. Is that a hobby? I guess so. I don't know. Um, it is very occasionally. And people wash your hands. It's flu season and stuff. You know, people can get sick. Anywho, I digress. Let's talk about whether or not this is a worthy investment of your time and money. Well, that's where it really comes in, right? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? I'm going to tell you right now, I wouldn't buy. Unless, unless... I couldn't find the miniature offered by anywhere else, and this is the best looking miniature out of all of them. I've done my research, and I say, I want to buy this Dragonborn palette, and I looked at the Reaper stuff offerings, I looked at other miniature companies, and nobody has the Dragonborn Paladin like this. Then I have no other choice. Then I'll paint it up as best as I can, and it will bother me because I can't get behind the cape as well. It would just bother me. But I would have to live with it because there's no other choice. So if I do have another choice, I would pick another miniature. If I don't have another choice, these are decent enough that you can field them onto your table and be cool. And it would be cool. And you could still impress your friends with it. So there's that. And that's my bottom line when it comes to purchasing this miniature, uh, these miniatures in particular, from what I have seen. Now, are they a value for the money? Well, I would say yeah. Actually, they are. They are pretty good. You get two miniatures. I'm going to switch over to some inks here just to get really deep lines onto the edge highlighting. I would say definitely that it was a deal. I and mean, you can get two miniatures for four bucks, so it's like two bucks a miniature when we're talking. And, you know, you, you get all that quality. You, you do get the nice sculpts. And if you're not as nitpicky as I am, then it's not really a big deal when it comes to not painting the back or something like that. Then yeah, go for it. This is this is the avenue you should travel. I'm saying me personally as a painter, there are certain things. Everybody has quirks to them. My quirks is I'm a bit OCD when it comes to a lot of things, and um, I get obsessed. I get I get so compulsive to paint miniatures that I'll do so for hours, and I'll get so obsessed that you know something is bothering me. I have to get it out of my sight because if I don't get it out of my sight, it's like. Ugh. It just bothers me upon bothers me upon bothers me. And, you know, there's no way. There is absolutely no way that I can put this onto my shelf knowing that I didn't paint the back. And I don't really repaint miniatures. The reason why I don't repaint, repaint miniatures because I'm always looking at where I went and where I'm going as a painter. And I'm always trying to improve. I haven't reached the top echelon of painting. Not by a long shot. I do see artists that are absolutely amazing and so much more than I am right now. But that's a goal that I set for myself to be able to do that. I don't look at miniature painting and people being better than me as a discouragement. I look at, I look at it and say, well, I started and look at my first miniature and this is where I started and look how, how much I've improved now. So several, and how many years did it take me to get there? And however many years that is, I'm going to look back at what I'm painting right now, which I think is decent, and then be so much better at it and say, Ugh, look at that, you know? So, and that's part of the journey. Whenever you do something, you get better at it. When you're painting miniatures, you're going to start and your first miniature, you're going to be all proud of, and it's going to be great. And in a couple of months, you're going to paint something else. And that first miniature is going to look like poop. It's just going to look terrible to you. It's going to be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I could have done this, I could have done this, I could have done this. But you were so proud of that miniature to begin with. But that miniature stands for you taking a step in the direction of miniature painting and not looking back, friend. Not looking back. You have entered the arena of the obsessive miniature painter. <laughs> one of us. One of us. One. Okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs> It's quite enjoyable, though. After a long day's work to come back, relax, and taking something gray and making it look pretty cool and, and awesome. And then other people, you know, validating that by saying, hey, man, that's really cool. All right, time to paint some eyes up. 
And when you're painting eyes, you want to put it a little closer to the middle and maybe looking up because when you're looking at the miniature from down uh, at a table, it's kind of looking up at you. It looks kind of cool. And that's exactly what I do. Sorry for the shield. I couldn't take the shield off because it wouldn't allow me to uh, do some sub-assemblies here. So, no, that is not my fault, Mr. WizKids. Not my fault at all. All right. I do have to say painting eyes on this is quite easy. The eyes are even. Now some of the miniatures that you get, uh, the eyes aren't even. In other words, like one is higher than the other and it looks terrible and there's nothing you can do about it. You can try to green stuff as much as possible, but oh my goodness, what a nightmare that is. Especially when they're just not even, it's just a poor sculpt. But this one, the eyes were even. So I have to give that a compliment right there. So I think that it, uh, I think the miniature actually came out pretty fantastic. Um, at that time anyway, <laughs> until I got bored with it and then I don't like it anymore. But uh, again, uh, this is a test model for my Stormcast Eternals. I don't know if I'm going to paint the true metallic metal. I'm not even sure just yet. I might have to because there's so many of them that I have and they need to get done. Dun, 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 dun. That Battle Force uh boxes coming in and man does it have stormcast eternals and i have the starter box which i haven't even touched yet and man does that have stormcast eternals so what i have is a force of stormcast eternals that's right they're coming to reap justice on them so i can only imagine what it'd be like to paint all those non-metallic metal and be like, I might pull my hair out at that point. Not that I have hair to speak of. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, so really, I mean, looking forward to it and dreading it at the same time, <laughs> it's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. Another thing that I wanted to get into are the towel. And that towel bottle force box is outrageous. Meaning those miniatures look amazing, absolutely amazing. And I know I'm a Space Wolves guy, but you know. I did a video a while back saying what motivates me to start a new army. It was a response uh, video to Vince Ventrola. And honestly, what, re what, what really motivates me is aesthetic and value for the dollar. And these Battle Force boxes... <sighs> My goodness, they are so good. They are so, so good. You know, it's, it's pretty bad on my part because the attraction. I'll say, I'll tell you, the getting cool stuff and the new shiny things and they look so cool is so, so hard. So, so hard. So this Christmas is going to be a pretty banner year, I think, this holiday season because I am looking to invest into a new camera for for the channel and uh, in doing so increasing the audio quality currently what I do is I use uh, a Yeti blue mic and I do that with voiceovers but now what I've gotten to do is sample the Yeti blue mic and then put it into the computer and record that sound on a separate uh, simple recorder and then dub it over onto the actual item. So the intros won't be monotone like it was before. The camera that I was using only had one mic port and it was in stereo surround sound. In fact, it was just monotone and it was absolutely horrendous. And I didn't even realize it was coming out of one speaker until I put it onto my TV and I heard it on one side. How When people told me that they listened to me and not essentially watched my videos, but listened to my videos while they were driving, Adam, that's you. And um, only heard it from one side. I was like, no, what am I doing? This is terrible, right? So I must remedy the situation as best as I can. So I record it separately and then I dub it over through the entire video. Now, the only problem with that is that sometimes I watch my video and towards the end of the video, I don't know what it is, whether it was the upload or something like that. Like 
The sound doesn't link up to my lips, which look absolutely unprofessional and horrible. And right now, there is absolutely nothing that I can do unless I want to revert back to going to one ear, which I don't want to do. I want to do the sound quality because some people, like I said, listen to me while they're hobbying, not necessarily looking at what I'm doing because what I'm doing there on the background is just painting it up and you can get any of the cues and paint it any way you'd like to. This one is definitely not just a tutorial. It's more of a a review and a paint and a chat. That's why I call it a painting chat, not really necessarily a tutorial. So yeah, sound quality needs to be on. That is a priority. So what I'm going to do is uh, invest in a new camera that has this bullet mic. And what I want to look into is getting some foam surrounds and putting them around where I'm recording so you don't hear the echo in the background, which you probably hear right now. So getting those two things, I think, would definitely improve the sound quality for my channel. And in doing so, uh, you can listen to it in your car, you can listen to it while you're hobbying, you can listen to it on your stereo or on your TV, and it will come across sounding nice instead of having all this background noise and all these other things, like things kicking in and out and and being able to to listen to when my heating system kicks in or something like that and you know generally you don't want to hear that stuff you just want to hear the voice so not that I'm saying my voice is anything special but you know yeah I'm just me yeah I'm just doing me painting these miniatures you know what I'm talking about that's all I'm doing <laughs> oh goodness gracious me so on another topic I do want to talk about or start talking about uh, uh, learning by design. Um, I love to teach. I love teaching about uh, miniature painting. I love teaching about other things as well. And I, I do love it. I love helping it and having people understand things and go, oh, wow, that's the way you do it. I am starting a painting class in my local game shop in Hagerstown. And uh, it's going to be a free class where you can come in and paint your minis. And I will be there. Uh, I'm going to try to be there once a week to be able to do it. Uh, Sunday afternoon sounds pretty good to me personally if I'm not too busy I don't know how long it's going to run maybe and once every other week so this way I'm not neglecting my family in any way shape or form and I would say afternoon because I have to go to church in the, the morning uh, it's something I dedicated myself to um, and I'd be lost without going to that and not doing that so I'm thinking about a painting class but right before I start that painting class it's time to do the power sword, sword, sword. So this is quite really, this is simple. And I did a simple power sword because I can get a nice transition with the different types of blues onto the sword with the white and then call it done. I later on painted the handle upon request a silver. Um, so I did that off screen. Also, what I did was is paint the edges of it white. So this way the transition could be in the middle and it would be a white sword as per requested also. Okay, so, but this is a really easy job to do uh, when you want to create a transition quickly and easily. You just paint it blue, have different darker blue for the shadows and the higher blues for the, and the white for, for the absolute highest highlights. And yep, that's pretty much all it takes. So yeah, going back to teaching and learning, uh, there are there is a new design model that's been kicking on. I don't know really how new it is. Uh, learning by design, uh, keeping the goal in mind and seeing how you can get to that goal. In other words, telling the kids, okay, this is what I'm expecting from you. This is the problem you need to solve. You can go and try to solve it any a multitude of different kind of ways to be able to, to come up with a solution in that. And you have to collaborate with each other to come up with a solution of uh, whatever problem that may be. And I just found so many similarities between uh, role-playing games and this new learning style that I'm using within my class. So I'm hoping to start, and this is my dream here, starting an educational program using role-playing games that helps kids work together as a team to be able to solve a multitude of problems using collaboration skills. And if I can model that somehow and be able to pull that off, ah, oh man, that would be an awesome dream for me. So I'm gonna really look into that educational prospect of using games to help build skills 
that are needed to life. If you think about a business meeting, people collaborate on things, people come up with presentations, they have organizations, and, and, and you know, forthwith. And these are skills that are employed in, in the games that we play. So melding games, melding games and education together in a fun way. So it's really melding two of my two of my very, very greatest passions, and I'm revealing that to you guys right now, that I want to do something like that. I'm going to do some research about that in and of itself and going down that avenue. I'm also teaching. I'm going to be teaching that class again. Uh, well, the place I'm, I'm going to be teaching is uh, Neverland Games, and that is in Hagerstown. And I will be there once every other Sunday, possibly, and just giving free classes to everybody and anybody who wants to take them. I'll sit down and go through the basics, like zenithal highlighting, using airbrushes, um, edge highlighting, and all the stuff that you can see on the channel. Now, you guys who are not privy to come over and to, to take a class with me is fine. Um, but at the same time, you could just look through the channels and look at my painting chats and stuff like that and get an idea or look at the, the tips, painting tips, which I do are a little more specific than the painting chats. Painting chats are fully, uh, fully built, uh, fully painted miniatures while the other one is just a specific skill that I kind of focus on or a specific, um, brand or, or or item that I use to be able to paint better with. And these are all the things that I'm just going to reiterate, but in person. So if anybody has a question, they can ask me directly and I can answer it the best that I can. I do try to keep in contact with other amazing award-winning artists. So if I have a question that stumps me, I can always go back and ask them for sage advice and then bring it to my group. Thus growing the community of miniature painters. And of course, once you have all these miniatures painted up, you kind of want to play them. I mentioned several times that I don't play uh, Warhammer or even 40k, and the reason I do that is because the meta is weak to non-existent. And ever since fantasy has gone down, down away with, nobody in this area has picked up Age of Sigmar, which is really sad because my armies are starting to become massive. Starting to, anyway. And, well... I'm thinking about starting, you know, a Age of Sigmar group at my local gaming shop as well. So bringing two painted groups in, really, and and start playing with those uh, might be something that I might entice. I also might start a Malifaux League and a 40k one as well. So painting classes for free and starting up some Age of Sigmar, uh, some Malifaux, and well as some 40k games in my area. Now that would be a goal for me. That and then coming up with an educational plan that melds uh, both RPG aspects of the hobby as well as uh, educational and, and skill building uh, activities. That would be also amazing. So I'm going to try to pioneer those things. All right, we're getting uh, close to the end of painting this miniature, at least for as far as this tutorial. Again, he uh, the customer wanted uh, the sword handle to better reflect metal, so I painted it metal as they requested. Although I personally felt that it looked good with the uh, blue faded handle. But uh, hey, you know what? The customer's always right, so there you go. Yeah. That's the thing about painted commissions. I don't think I will ever do a commission for money only because, well, if I don't think something looks right and the, the customer thinks it looks right, I, I have an issue with that. So unless I paint, they tell me, hey, here's miniatures painted any way you want to paint it. And I'm like, um, okay, I'll do that. And uh, if you don't like it, you know, the milk's still dry. Milk's still dry. All right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, then that's the only way I would ever do a commission. But, you know, I, I kind of get personally attached to some of these miniatures that I actually paint. So I don't know if that's a dangerous thing or not, but I actually care about them. And I often think about putting names to each and every one of them. I wonder if there's enough. There probably is enough names to be able to name them all. Cool kind of names. Maybe there are name generators that I can use from D and uh, D or something like that to be able to name them all, and come up with different names from history and all these kinds of things. I'm sure there's enough names for the miniatures that I paint, um, no matter how many thousands I get. 
I think it'd be fine. One day. One day. Hey, terrain doesn't get a name, right? Unless it can. It's a corner of a, a street or something like that. <laughs> there he is. Look at him. He's starting to look really good there. Oh, that's a couple of more touch-ups here, and he is done. Which is the base. That's right. You always paint the base uh, black. I mean, it separates the environment that's within the mini from the environment that's outside the mini, that's your domain. What's inside that, uh, inside the black line is that little miniature's little world. That's a part of the world that he occupies, and nothing else can, can get in there. And what defines it the most is having a black base. So guys or girls, paint up your bases. It's so worth it, and it makes it look great. So okay, so WizKids Miniatures. I give it a one thumb up and one thumb down. One thumb down because it's a little frustrating for me personally to paint. Uh, definitely a thumb up because, well, that was the only downside really. Um, you get two miniatures. They already come primed. They have a small bases. That was a negative. Um, they have ultra detail and they're value for the money. So use your own judgment to be able to buy these if you want to. For me personally, I have so many miniatures that eh, I don't think I'm ever, I don't know. I'm never gonna say never, but it doesn't look likely that I'll pick up one of these ever again. Um, that's a bold statement. But, you know, I think it came out all right. <laughs> well, I hope you really enjoyed this and you got something from this review, this painting chat, this tutorial, this um, me rambling on, whatever you wanna call it. And I want you to have a happy time painting miniatures and I'll catch you on the flip side. Peace. Well, that's all there is to it to paint this little guy up. If you looking into getting a miniature started and just adding to your miniature collection, this is maybe an option for you. Well, if you thought this video was helpful, like, share, and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time on the Miniatures Paintbrush. Peace.